Hello, my name is Kyle Rose, and the title of this presentation is Inner Products from an Order Theoretic Perspective. This research was done in collaboration with myself, Zachary Ward, and our research advisor, Dr. Christopher Schwanke. Here is a brief overview of what our research is about and what you can expect to see in this presentation. First, we generalize what we call inner products on vector spaces. Inner products are some pretty useful tools that allow us to calculate the lengths of vectors and the angles between them. And finally, we reprove some famous results and even generalize them to more abstract settings using order theoretic techniques. Now, before we get to that last point, we need to define several things. First, let's start with defining what a vector space is. A vector space is simply what it sounds like, a space or a collection of vectors. And in this space, vectors can be added together and multiplied by a real number, called a scalar. As an example, 2D vectors can form a vector space, as seen in the picture here. We can add two vectors together by connecting the starting point of one vector to the end point of the other. And we can scale and multiply them by scaling up or down the vector and reversing the direction when multiplying by a negative number. Here's how we denote 2D vectors and what it will look like on a graph. The name of the vector is in bold and is written as the terminal point x, y with angle brackets instead of parentheses. And looking at the graph, you can see it's depicted as an arrow that starts at initial point 0, 0, or the origin, and points to a terminal point x, y. Now we can finally define what an inner product is. Think of this as like multiplying two vectors. We take two vectors, multiply their x and y's, and add them together. And it's important to note that we do get a real number solution here. As previously said, we can use the inner product to find the magnitude or length of the vector, which is also called the norm. We do this by taking the square root of the inner product with itself. The norm is known with two bars on each side of the vector with a subscript of one. With these definitions, we can see something that I feel is probably familiar to all of us, most likely seen at one point or another in our high school math classes. Here we have the classical Pythagorean theorem. It may look a little bit different, but still the same a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And this is only true when a and b are perpendicular, or they form a right angle. Additionally, it is important to note that here that a and b are only perpendicular when the inner product of the two are equal to zero. Now, moving on, we get to see something that several of us may be a bit unfamiliar with. Um, an infimum of a set of numbers is the largest number that is less than or equal to every number in that set. Think of this as like the absolute minimum or the greatest lower bound or a floor function. Similarly, we have something called a supremum, which is the smallest number that is greater than or equal to every number in that set. Once again, think of this as like the absolute max or the smallest upper bound or ceiling function. As an example, let A be this set of real numbers that include 1, 10, 4, 5, and a decreasing sequence that approaches 0. Clearly, 10 is greater than or equal to every number in A, so it must be the supremum. Now, the infimum of A is 0 because while it's not in A, it is less than everything in A, but is greater than any other lower bound, like for example, negative 1 or negative 10. Now, let's define what M2 is. M2 is a set or a collection of all 2 by 2 matrices with real number entries. For example, A and B here are uh, in M2 because it has the correct form, there's two rows and two columns, and each entry is a real number. So naturally, matrices have operations. We can add them together, and we can multiply them by some scalar. So thus, M2 is a vector space. Also, M2 is an example of an order space, because we can write A is less than or equal to B when every entry in A is less than or equal to the corresponding entry in B. So we can use this to find an infimum of two matrices. We just need to take the smallest of each of the two corresponding entries. And similarly, this works for a supremum, but instead taking the largest of each of the two corresponding entries. Now lastly, we need to define two new vectors, U and V, such that they are 4D vectors. We can tell they are 4D because they have four variables, W, X, Y, and Z. Also, let's define a new generalized inner product, T hat, where we take in the two 4D vectors and we get a two by two matrix. 
This is extremely important to understand because we aren't getting a real number as an answer, like the first definition of an inner product. So now we're bringing everything full circle. The norm, or length, of a 2D vector must satisfy this new infimum. Why? This is actually derived from the geometric mean. We can see this by looking inside the square root. It is the square root of the inner product times 1. This observation allows us to define a new generalized norm that works for any 2x2 two two matrix with all positive entries. The classical norm and the generalized norm looks really similar, but it's important to note here that there is no square root in our new generalized norm and there is a subscript of A outside our new norm. Also, the generalized magnitude of a 4D vector isn't a real number, but a 2x2 two two matrix. With these new definitions of inner product norm, we are able to update the previous Pythagorean theorem. We first have our classical version with 2D vectors, now with the order theoretic perspective. Then, a new generalized version that takes 4D vectors and 2 by 2 matrices. In addition, this not only works for Pythagorean theorem, but other famous results. As an example, here's the new and improved parallelogram law, both in the classical version and also a generalized version. And this is the important part to take away from all this. Our order theoretic methods work for many different generalized inner products and generalized norms, whereas the classical version of these proofs do not. This means that the generalized norms and inner products don't have to be just 4D vectors and 2x2 two two matrices. It could be other mathematical objects. Plus, the new generalized versions help solve the problem of the classical versions not working in higher abstract settings, where certain operations may not, be, may not work. So now lastly, I want to take this last bit of time to say our future work will be about strengthening and reproving um, other famous results using the order of theoretic techniques that have been outlined in this presentation. And if there are any further questions, feel free to email any one of us, being myself, Dr. Schwanke, or Zach at our Lion emails, mine being kyle.rose at lion.edu. And thank you for watching.